Hi, my name's MJ and I'm an educator at the RISD Museum in Providence, Rhode Island. You can pause this video at any time to look, think, or respond to my questions and activities. You'll need a pen or pencil and a piece of paper to write with, so now's a good time to go grab those. The room you're seeing in this photo is a gallery with different ceramics on display. One of the cool things about going to an art museum or browsing a museum's website is that you can see a big range of artworks all in the same place. I love that because sometimes I see connections that I didn't expect and sometimes I find a type of artwork or a style that I want to try out in my own way. On the left is a photograph of a landscape in Arizona by a British artist named Paul Scott, which has some similarities to this 200-year-old landscape painting by British-American artist Thomas Cole on the right, which you can actually learn more about in another virtual visit. Can you notice two things that are similar about these artworks? How about two differences? Paul Scott, who took the photograph we just saw on the left, is an artist who works in the medium of transfer printed ceramics. Paul was invited to explore art at the RISD Museum and to curate an exhibit, which he titled New American Scenery. He decided to display ceramics from the 1700s and 1800s alongside new ceramics that he made inspired by the traditional techniques and compositions. Although the old and new ceramics are visually similar, it's mostly blue and white, he adds new imagery and materials into his art to communicate ideas about American places, people, and the environment today. While most of the older ceramics in new American scenery were made in England, blue and white ceramics didn't originate there. Blue and white ceramics were being made in China during the Tang Dynasty, a period from 618 to 906, and in the Middle East during the Abbasid Caliphate's rule as early as the 800s. Trade routes such as the Silk Road, which you see just a few paths of here, connected artists to new materials and inspirations from other cultures for thousands of years. Transferware is the specific technique that contemporary artist Paul Scott is interested in. Often blue and white, transferware was mostly made in Britain and was popularly sold there and in the U.S. through the late 1700s and 1800s, when British American artist Thomas Cole was making landscape paintings like the one we saw earlier. A lot of transferware ceramics featured places, buildings, and landscapes. What other similarities do you notice in these two examples? While Chinese blue and white ceramics were traditionally hand painted, European style transferware was developed to replicate the same design on many ceramics so more could be sold at a cheaper price. Traditionally, transferware artists would make very detailed etchings in metal, like this, then fill the metal plate with ink. They'd use a press to print the pictures onto a type of tissue paper. The paper with the ink on it is carefully placed on a plate before it is fired or baked in an oven called a kiln. Today, Paul is able to use a computer printer to print decals instead of hand carving and printing the images. Here you can see Paul Scott with two small modern kilns powered by electricity. Old British factory kilns were huge brick ovens that could fire lots of pottery at once. Here, Paul Scott describes what it's like to make transferware. Uh, and of course, with transferware, uh, you have to have some idea of the form that your design is going to be placed upon because uh, the copper plates um, has to be engraved in a particular shape, the pattern has to fit a particular shape, and then that uh, print is taken off the copper plate on a piece of pottery tissue, and then it's applied to bisqueware. Uh, and and you, can't, you can't move it around, you've got to apply it right the first time and um a friend of mine you know once referred to it as like uh, transfer 
making tissue prints for transfer is like like making clothes to fit a person you you, you, you can map the surface of ceramic objects using pottery tissue very much like you would for dressmaking patterns and um, so it's a very similar sort of process where you you take flat things and you wrap them around a three-dimensional form and it's quite a challenge in the 1800s souvenir plates were created for towns and cities in europe and the united states usually they showed close-ups of important buildings or landscapes from those places people who traveled could collect them from local shops Here's a souvenir style plate that Paul Scott made more recently with scenes from the town of Shiprock, New Mexico on Navajo reservation land. Getting back to the idea of landscape, here's another photograph of a landscape by Paul Scott. In the picture, we see Timothy Benali, a member of the Navajo Nation, a Native American territory that spans land in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. In the photo, Timothy is walking up a road that leads to a uranium mine where he used to work. And here is a transferware plate that Paul Scott created using that photograph of Timothy walking in the landscape. Notice any differences? I'm noticing how Paul chose a longer platter style plate to fit most of the original image in the new composition. There's actually a lot of white left blank on this plate, and the edges remind me a bit of flower petals. I'm also seeing a blob-like shape in the lower left corner. Here's a quote from Paul about an unusual material that he added before firing this plate in the kiln. The material, uranium glass, gives it that fuzzy greenish blob you see in the detail here. Used for bombs and nuclear power stations, uranium also has a history as a colorant for glass and ceramics. I've used fragments of uranium glass fired on top of the glaze print. The beautiful pictorial landscapes, like the real places they depict, also contain the deadly ore. Paul Scott mentions that uranium was a desirable material in the US during the 1900s for weapons used in war, and for everyday household items like plates. Unfortunately, people did not realize how deadly the material was. At the top of this souvenir plate that Paul made, you can see Timothy Bonali again, in front of a sign for the Office of Navajo Uranium Workers. Timothy says he's alive today because he kept getting fired from his job at the uranium mines, for protesting the unsafe conditions he and his co-workers were working under. Unfortunately, many of his co-workers and their family members died from cancer and other illnesses related to so much uranium exposure. Here's a close-up showing a small piece of uranium glasses effect on the central landscape in that souvenir style plate that Paul made. Again, this plate combines both the beauty and the scary history and current reality of uranium exposure for the Navajo community who live in Shiprock. What ideas do you think Paul is trying to communicate by making this artwork? Paul Scott's transferware often focuses on places that are known for systemic racism, a key part of American life that is often left out of traditional transferware imagery. Systemic racism is a term for the ways that political and social systems discriminate against people of color, causing inequalities in experiences related to health and healthcare, housing, wealth and income, education, and more. It is one reason that the health of people in the Navajo Nation is still so impacted by uranium. This plate Paul made shows the city of Flint, Michigan, where systemic racism has played a role in the government's inaction around unhealthy amounts of lead, a poisonous element, entering the city's water supply in 2014. Despite Flint residents, the majority of whom are African American, continuing to advocate for safe water, the problem persists. 
Can you see the area where Paul placed a small piece of lead before he fired this plate in the kiln? I notice it totally burned through the glaze and made a large watery effect around it. Paul Scott shows beautiful landscapes while also exposing the environmental problems and systemic racism experienced by people in the Navajo Nation and in Flint, Michigan by including lead and uranium in his pieces. In my city, Providence, there's also a lot of lead in people's water. It made me wonder if there's more lead in some neighborhoods than in others and what actions are being done to solve that problem. Take about 10 minutes to pause and do some research about environmental health and safety in your hometown. Write your answers to the following prompts based on your findings. What issues related to environmental health and safety exist in your town or city? Are there efforts to solve or lessen the impacts of that issue? If so, what are they? If not, what ideas do you have? When you're ready to write, you can use the sentence starters to help you begin. Paul Scott looked at images and styles from the past to inspire his art about the present. I'm going to challenge you to look around at your city or town today and imagine what it could look like in the future, about 100 years from now, if one systemic priority was to improve the health of all people and the environment. You might want to think about the issue you reflected on. What would some of your favorite or least favorite places in your town or city look like if the issue was resolved? What would it take to make your home a healthy, fun, amazing place to live for everyone? What would scenes from that version of your hometown look like? You can write your answers or draw your own plate, the souvenir of your town. There's a printable template for this in the lesson plan, but I don't have a printer at home. So I cut out a circle and drew a border and lines to make some different areas for scenes of my souvenir plate. Providence has a lot of old lead water pipes and the rivers and bay are polluted from old industry. So they're not safe to swim in or eat fish from. So when I was thinking about a future version of the river that runs near the RISD Museum, I decided, I looked up a picture and I drew this version of it where people are able to swim and play in the river. In some of the other boxes, I was thinking about ways that both people and the environment could be more healthy. There's a house near mine that's abandoned, but could be redesigned as affordable housing with windows that are also solar panels. Here's the prompt again. Get creative and be specific with the scenes and places that you draw. You might even want to go take a walk or look at pictures online to help you envision a future version of those places. I hope you've enjoyed exploring Paul Scott's responses to American landscapes through his ceramics and have been inspired to reflect on environmental health in your hometown. If you have any questions or thoughts you'd like to share, or if you want to post some of your work, we would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me and please stay in touch with all of us at the RISD Museum.